Okay. Hi, Lisa. Welcome to the Explorer Poet Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, I'm really excited to have you as well. Um, I I guess I should just say this up front. Like, I'm a genuine fan of your podcast. Mm. And um, so I do. It is kind of strange to be sitting here talking to you now because I've heard uh, I've heard you talk a lot. And um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I've actually learned a lot from you and from your co-hosts, Deb Stewart and Joseph Lee. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I just want to say. Uh, you do a lot of things. Um, one of the things that I really appreciated that you do is your This Union Life podcast. Thanks. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. I love doing it. <laughs> yeah. And, um, I want to get into it, but first I want to, uh, I want to talk a little bit about your background, mostly in relation to the, the psychoanalytical world, the depth psychology, Carl Jung, and just what is it that what is it that brought you to this world or what do you think drew you there? And, and maybe mm -hmm. when, when was the first time you encountered it and, mm -hmm. and, uh, kind of got that excitement for it? Uh, well, I'll give you the long answer to the question. I, I love long is, answers. Okay. My, my mother, um, was very interested in Jung and she used to read the collected works while we were, my sister and I were at school. And in fact, uh, you know, the first thing you do when you get accepted into analytic training is you buy the entire collected works. Mine are back there on that shelf behind me in the corner. And uh, probably about a third to half of the volumes actually were my mother's and they have her notes in the margin, which is really very precious to me. Um but, uh, and, and, and so I was pretty young at this point and she, I remember her telling me some of the stories from memories, dreams, reflections, which was Jung's autobiography. So there's this, uh, this thing that happened to him where there was this tremendous psychological tension, uh, you know, sort of in, in the period after the break with Freud and during the kind of confrontation with the unconscious, and, uh, you know, this was in his house in Kuznacht outside of Zurich, right on the lake. And there was, there was all this, uh, uh, tension and in the house and it was just palpable. And then one day the bell started ringing at the front door and it, you know, it was a physical bell on a, on a line and it, the bell is in the house and the pull cord is outside. So the bell is ringing wildly. And they look out the window and there's no one there. And it was right after that, that Jung felt this kind of uprushing of energy and just started writing what's, what's called the Septum Sermones Sed Mortuus, the seven sermons to the dead, which is a very odd piece of writing, but contains so much of his thought in essence, it's very kind of Gnostic. And, uh, so it was kind of a parapsychological experience. And I was always interested in that kind of stuff. So my mom told me that story and I did not forget it. She told me one or two other stories too about Jung. And I was like, well, that's kind of interesting. Um, I did eventually get to visit Jung's house a few years ago and I saw that bell and it's a big bell. So it's still there. Anyway, um, kind of knew who Jung was at a very early age because of this. But of course, uh, I didn't want to go, you know, as I started to kind of get older and went to adolescence, I obviously wasn't interested in anything either one of my parents were interested in, right? I mean, I had to kind of become my own person. I remember in the eighth grade, they make us, they made us take like a, a personality test and, and then said, oh, you know, here's some professions you'd be good at. And like my top profession. So here I am, like what, like 13 at that point or something. It's like, you would be a good psychologist. I was like, oh my God, that's ridiculous. I would never want to do that. I'm not really sure why I thought that, but I was just, no, you know. So I, I went to college and, you know, studied history. And I worked after graduating, I worked in the field of international humanitarian affairs and had no interest in psychology, wasn't going anywhere near it. The little I knew about, uh, the little I knew about psychology, it seemed very, um, kind of like debasing and pathologizing. And it just didn't, it didn't have any interest for me at all. And then when I was uh, 28, I fell into a depression and I, uh, I, I was living in New York 
and I uh, was living on the Upper West Side, 81st in Columbus. And uh, I, I used to go into this little bookstore. I was in graduate school at Columbia and getting a master's in international affairs. Um, but I would go into this little bookstore because I like bookstores and I would go down to the psychology and self-help section. <laughs> and there was this book on the shelf called On the Way to the Wedding. And I was heartbroken. I'd had a relationship end. And I would pick that book up off the shelf and open it up to any page and immediately start crying. And then I would think I should buy this book. And then I would say, I have 400 pages of reading to do this week. I'm in graduate school. I can't buy a book for pleasure. So I'd put it back on the shelf. But this must have happened three or four times. And then one day in particular, I was in a particularly... Oh, I don't know. I mean, sad doesn't seem to do it justice. Just um, anguished. I was in anguish. And I tried everything I could to uh, to banish that anguish. You know, I did all of the things that, that I would do to try to feel better. And just nothing was working. And the last thing I did that day was go over to the bookstore. I found myself in the psychology self-help section. I saw that book. I picked it up off the shelf. I opened it. I started to cry. I put it back on the shelf. Then uh, to walk home, I had to cross Columbus Avenue and there was a little new age gift shop pretty much across the street from the bookstore called The Hero's Journey. Not making this up. So I go in there. It's the kind of place that has like dream catchers and some incense and a few crystals. At the back of the store, it has like a dozen books. It's not a bookstore. One of the books that it has is on the way to the wedding. So even then, without knowing necessarily what synchronicity was, I was like, I think that's the universe telling me to buy that book. So I bought the book and I took it back to my apartment and it was a signed copy. And I started reading it and, and immediately, um, I started feeling better because um, the book, it was written by a Jungian analyst named Linda Leonard. And the book is, uh, it provided a larger frame for me to understand my anguish. You know, Jung says we don't solve our problems so much as grow larger than them. And, and that book helped me see my suffering from this larger, wider perspective and uh, and by the end of it, I was I was just in love with this worldview. I mean, I felt like I'd I felt like I'd rediscovered my native tongue that I had long since forgotten. And it's such a beautiful worldview. It's ennobling, and uh, and rich. And you know, I honestly, by the time I finished the book, I thought wonder if I would like to be a Jungian analyst someday. And of course, it was many, many years later that I, that I, you know, saw that through. But that, that's the story of how, how I found, how I came to Jung. Wow. Yeah. A very, um, yeah, very synchronistic. I find myself wandering into those types of esoteric crystals and, you know, uh, statues and I don't know. I, I find myself just wanting to find something there sometimes. Uh, when you talk about this worldview, do you mind just explaining that a little bit? What is this worldview that you mean, or or what's like a yeah? What's a, what's a way to understand it? Yeah. Oh boy. Uh, I mean, it's it, it. You know, there is almost a kind of Jungian cosmology because with his uh, development of the idea of synchronicity, which he developed with the physicist Wolfgang Pauli. Uh, you know, he's really getting into um, positing that there's a kind of interconnection between all things. And and that's very interesting. And of course, uh, his idea of the collective unconscious posits that we we all draw upon this same underground river, that we're we're all humans are connected with this storehouse of universal images and patterns. Um, and I, and I find both of those ideas really beautiful. Right. And, and the, uh, 
and mysterious and and powerfully explanatory of some phenomena that would otherwise be difficult to explain. But I, I think the other kind of big idea that I think of as part of the Jungian worldview is this notion of the self, that there is this part of us that he said we might as well call it the God within. There's this part of us that is um, bigger, deeper, wider. Uh, it's bigger than our conscious ego by a lot. And we can have a relationship with it. And it kind of uh, holds our destiny. It understands our destiny. It communicates with us. It communicates with us through synchronicities, like me finding that book. It communicates with us through our dreams. Uh, and and it it uh, guides us in some way. There's a sense of, you know, another word that Jung liked to use is telos. So there's a sense that we're going somewhere, that we're meant to go somewhere, uh, which is a which is a wonderful way to feel. And I, I think it accurately describes how I often do feel. And some people don't feel that way and they long <laughs> to feel that way. And I, I suppose I'm lucky that I do often feel that way. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's it's really interesting, especially for me, so I grew up in a very religious situation. And so, mm -hmm. uh, having, uh, you know, my fall from grace or my disillusionment with my religion of birth, there was a part of me that still sought after some kind of spirituality or some kind of connection. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting the way that this, these Jungian ideas can actually provide that in yeah. a way that's not dogmatic. It's more, yes. it's, yeah, it's more like, uh, it gives you a structure to then kind of explore and experience. And I yeah. think it's, I often say this connection between psychology and physics, it seems to me that everything that we're trying to figure out in our modern day, it boils down to these two things. It's either mm. physics or it's psychology because all the other sciences seem to be some kind of a derivative of physics. And then whether it's history or religion or philosophy, they all seem to be some kind of derivative of psychology. Yeah. And um, I think it's in it's in Jung's book, Man and His Symbols. It's not Jung. I think it might be uh, von Franz who says that it just may be that the difference between matter and spirit is that one is the experience in the outward way and one is the experience in the inward way. And mm -hmm. it's there's just a lot of, you know, I, even reading uh, Bertrand Russell, you can really see how there's this connection between psyche and matter. Mm -hmm. And in a way, it's just kind of a reflection of itself mm -hmm. or kind of the same thing. I yeah, find it fascinating. Very... Yeah. And in a way it is, it's very, when you can feel it, that's the thing about Jung too, is reading Jung. Uh, when you can feel it, then you get that sense of some kind of something bigger than you that you get to take part in, which is very exciting. Mm -hmm. My first, the first book of Jung I read was Memories. No, I think I read Man and His Symbols first. And then mm -hmm. I read uh, Memories, Dreams, Reflections. And I think I have that in the right order. And then um, the sense that I got was this feeling of, it was very, it, it was almost like this scary feeling that came over me as I kind of went through it mm. and realized that these things he was talking about, having different parts of himself that were often in odds, I could feel that in myself. And again, coming from the world I came from, it was a very ego driven world because you had to, you had to you know, hold tight and be strong. And it was very ego centric. And then to feel that kind of shift towards something, something else was very, uh, I would say it was very uncomfortable. Yeah. And w one thing I wanted to ask you in this whole realm of Jungian psychology, this worldview, there's this idea of the archetypes. Mm -hmm. And I like to ask, uh, often I'll ask people similar questions about myth or archetype. But one thing I wanted to it's just something I've been dwelling on is this idea that the through life, we actually identify with these different archetypes. And so I wanted to, I just wanted to get your thoughts on like identifying with archetypes, but then also being able to shift away from that almost mm -hmm. as if we have to move to the next archetype. And if, if you just had any quick thoughts about that. Well, sure. I, I, I'll, I'll definitely answer that. But first of all, can I, can I ask you, what was your religion of birth? Yeah, I grew up LDS or Mormon. Okay. And mm -hmm. in a way that was, um, 
it was just a little bit more intense, I think, than most of the LDS or Mormon people that I meet, just because we we were homeschooled and we lived in the mm. country. And so it was wow. just very, very isolating. Mm-hmm. Um, and looking back now, I can see the, I can see the, the motivation for the situation from my parents' perspective, mm-hmm. uh, knowing their story. But, um, yeah, it was just very clear that the idea was to instill in us just this literal interpretation that was going to, you know, protect us throughout our lives. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, it's so, it's so, it's so interesting. I mean, one of, one of the ideas of Jung that I, I find, uh, really important is that we're, we're sort of hardwired to relate to the transpersonal, that there is a religious drive. And, and this is borne out, uh, in, you know, studies of, you know, sociology and, uh, political science and all kinds of things like that. Like it's clear that we have that need, you know, um, and, and, uh, and we, we, we long to find some way and many of the kind of dogmatic religions don't provide that container anymore that allow, I mean, if they ever did, I don't know, but maybe they did once upon a time for many people, but they don't seem to be doing, serving that function so much anymore. So, um, I mean, there's a lot more we could say about that too, but I'll, I'll go on to your questions about, um, archetypes, you know, what Jung said about the archetypes is that they have us, we don't have them. And I know that there, there's a lot of kind of popularization of it, like find out which archetype you are, or, you know, here are the 12 archetypes. And I mean, I, I shouldn't be so disparaging. I'm sure there's, uh, there's good stuff in, in that work as well. But what Jung would say about the archetype is you better damn well not identify with it because then you are in the state of psychological inflation, which can, can look like a a pretty extreme state of mental unwellness. So it's more like an archetype can get constellated in our life. So, I mean, I guess one example would be, uh, if you have a baby, you know, and, and you're a mother, then the great mother archetype is on the scene and gets constellated and those energies sort of infuse you and you're kind of carrying those energies to an extent. Or when you fall in love, maybe you are uh, kind of drinking in some of uh, the, the energy of Aphrodite. Um, but but to think that we could choose or would choose or uh, either consciously or unconsciously to identify with an archetype would actually be pretty dangerous. It's it's more that they kind of constellate and come online in certain uh, like life situations in an individual or even in certain collective uh, situations in in uh, society. Yeah, I almost think of the you know in the odyssey the the gods that appear to the different characters when odysseus Mm -hmm. needs something and athene appears to him and whispers in his ear and then he can take that Mm -hmm. um rather than him thinking that he is athene or something like that right right yeah he is a god yeah that's a good i like that image okay um yeah so i i do want to talk just briefly about your podcast this union life and then we can jump into your book um but again, uh, I am a fan. I would say I would say that there are probably a couple of episodes that have really stood out to me, mm-hmm. and I find it. I mean, I find it shocking how deep the three of you can go when it comes mm-hmm. to the the symbols um, and the stories, and then connecting other stories. And um, I just find that there's such a depth of recall, and um, and also what also I've noticed, especially more recently is that the three of you are analysts, right? And so you have, uh, you have like an analyst voice a lot of the time mm. where you're, you know, you're saying it, you know, you're digging in, you're getting very serious about it. But one thing I've noticed more recently is you, you also have a very playful back and forth. Mm-hmm. And, um, I just think it's, it makes it actually really fun. There's like a, uh, personalization or like, you know, something connecting about it. And I think it's fun. But um, one question I have to ask is about Joseph and his voice and how deep and resonant it is. And if this is something that just kind of comes out during his analysis or is Joseph always this deep and resonating? (laughs) 
<laughs> well, uh, you know, he has a couple of different aspects. I mean, of course, like any of us, he has m- different kinds of aspects of his personality. You're just sitting having dinner with him and sharing a glass of wine. He doesn't tend to sound as um, <laughs> sonorous and serious and somber. But uh, but I think, you know, he has a vast body of knowledge, not just about Jung, but also about uh uh, Kabbalah, for example, and he, when he starts talking about that, he can kind of conjure up. He can, the the archetype of the uh, uh, maybe the wise teacher constellates, and yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, I found it as especially um, this last episode that you guys had. Well, maybe it was your last, but it was the last one I listened to. But it's about your new book, mm-hmm. and um, there's a lot of playfulness back and forth in regards to. Uh, your opinions about things like television shows. Yeah. Um, uh, and, uh, oh, what's what's the one that came up? Um, we were talking about The Sopranos. Yes, The Sopranos, yeah. And yeah. just, and then, uh, yes, yeah, some, some, a little bit of playful snarkiness. It was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, how did the three of you get together and how, what was like the, the impetus behind the podcast? Mm-hmm. And, and I, I imagine that you've been friends longer than just the podcast, mm-hmm. but what, what what brought the three of you together to do that, and what kind of what was the overall ob- objective? So I met. Uh, we all met in analytic training. I met Deb in two thousand, and then Joseph joined the seminar a few years later. And we all Deb and I got into training first. No, Deb got in first, then I got in, and then Joseph was in like a couple of years later. So we all we were all in this kind of container at the same time. So we there would be these like great weekends in Philadelphia when we'd sort of sit in this room overlooking Rittenhouse Square and we'd be, you know, reading Greek tragedy or, uh, you know, Jungian authors or presenting cases or learning about dream theory. Uh, and, you know, I mean, you know, the three of us, all three of us are fairly extroverted and have pretty big personalities and, and like to have fun. So we we would just have there'd be a lot of lively conversation and and we'd we'd uh you know we take coffee breaks and go go get coffee and we started calling it caffeinatio you know to make it sound like an alchemical <laughs> process which it kind of is um so we just had a lot of fun and we really enjoyed each other we really enjoyed those those weekends in Philadelphia and then one by one we graduated. And so although we were still friends, we didn't have that like container that brought us together, you know, that kind of shared intention, that shared project that I think is, you know, for many people, certainly for me, uh, really the basis of um, my closest friendships are when, when we're, we're engaged in something together. I love creating something with other people. That is just a real sweet spot for me. And, uh, so I had been on someone's podcast and because this is the way my brain works, whenever I do something, I think whenever I see something new, I go, would I want to do that? So I I had that little, what would that be like to have a podcast? And I kind of just held it for a little while. I wanted to see if it really had energy for me and it didn't go away, but I knew I didn't want to do it alone. So a couple months later, I, Deb, Deb and Joseph and I were at a, a meeting, an analyst meeting. And, and during the lunch break, I said, I have an idea for you guys. Would you guys want to do a podcast? And they both immediately said, oh, my God, yes. And then Deb said, what's the podcast? <laughs> she was she was so, ready to go before she knew the yeah, yeah. the content. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. It was it was very lots of energy out of the right out of the barn. Yeah, it sounds the the image you paint of being in Philadelphia with like minded people interested in the same things diving into it together it's it's pretty dreamlike yeah it, it uh, was amazing yeah for a nerd like me and then mm-hmm. also yeah coffee is pretty alchemical huh it dissolves in it and it warms <laughs> your soul um, that's right the fire lights your inner furnace <laughs> yes exactly yeah yeah um, that's awesome so another thing that I really enjoy about the podcast is that you guys end every episode with some dream interpretation. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's fun because it's a switch from the conversation because it doesn't really, um, it's hard to take somebody's dream from outside and then make it flow into the conversation. So it's like, you don't even worry about that. And so it's Mm -hmm. like this little treat at the end where it's Mm -hmm. like this other, this other thing. Um, when it, 
And I also, I think you do a great job of kind of bouncing ideas off of each other and then always just kind of admitting that there's no solid interpretation, that it may be this, it may be that, but really it's up mm -hmm. to the dreamer and the mm -hmm. connection with their waking life. Um, so it's just all great stuff. Do you have any advice or just quick best practices if somebody wanted to take a look at their dream, take a look at somebody's dream? What's like the, what's the best way to approach it? Well, only the dreamer can be the expert on his or her dream. So, uh, you know, I would, if you're going to be talking about someone else's dream, I would, um, suggest you not. <laughs> um, although, you know, there's this, uh, this, um, dream analyst Montague Allman who created this, uh, kind of, um, framework for dream groups. And, uh, he has a lovely, uh, kind of rhythm of saying, if this were my dream, this would make me think X. So if you are going to comment on someone else's dream, you might say, if this were my dream. And we do we do really try to hold everything really tentatively when we do the dream interpretation on the podcast, especially because we don't have the dreamer there. So a lot of what we're, it's really just, it's kind of speculation with a, hopefully with a uh, the intention of helping people understand a symbolic approach to any material. I will say that we've had a number of people whose dreams we've spoken about on the podcast who then write us and say, wow, that was completely uncanny. <laughs> you, know, you, 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 you picked up, how did you know that about my life? You know, yeah. I remember this, this one woman, you know, it was just like a tree in a backyard. And I, I can't remember what made us say it or who said it, it was like, I wonder if there was childhood trauma. And she was like, oh my God, how did you know that? <laughs> so, yeah. um, there's like, there can be a lot of information in a dream, but for working with your own dreams, um, actually, I, I think that listening to a couple of the dream segments would give you a sense of, uh, kind of how to begin to walk around your dream. And we do have an online program to teach you how to work with your dreams. It's called dream school. And we're actually coming out with a book in a few months called Dreamwise. Unlocking the, I think it's, I think the subtitle is unlocking, unlocking the secrets of your dreams or something. And I have to say, I am so excited about this book. I am so, uh, I just, I'm so proud of what we've created. It's never, it's, there's nothing like it out there. And we've really, I think successfully operationalized Jungian dream interpretation. So, um, I would definitely say get our book. <laughs> yeah, but, absolutely. Um, the number one little tidbit that I will give people when you want to start working with your dreams is to imagine that the dream is kind of a communication from the dream maker, from the self with the capital S, from this other bigger, broader part of you who is not, it's not like that part necessarily knows more or knows better, but it does know something different. It is bringing a fresh perspective and so it's going to tell you something you didn't know or that it's going to, it might, you know, it might tell you something you kind of know, but haven't fully integrated, but it's going to tell you, it's not just going to confirm what you already know. And if you wake up and you think, oh, I know what that dream is about. That's because my boss is a bitch. You know, it's like, you have not understood the dream. If you wake up and you think, I know what that dream is about nine times out of 10, maybe even more, you haven't gotten the dream, gotten to the point of the dream yet, because the, 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 ad, the sort of the view of the unconscious is, uh, is, is going to feel really alien. It's going to feel kind of foreign. And so my, my number one tip is, is, uh, this, this, uh, assumption that the least trustworthy part, part of the dream is the dream ego, which is the I in the dream, the kind of dream self. So if your dream self is very angry because it feels dissed by someone in the dream, try on for size. What happens if the attitude of the dream ego is wrong? How does that change how you relate to the stuff in the dream? And uh, that would be, a, it's not that it's always, it's not that it is always wrong. Sometimes it isn't. But it most of the time, it it's a either it's wrong or it's a little wrong. You know, it's a little off. And and so, try that on for size and see. You know, you might have to work at it. See what comes up from that. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because I think that a lot of times people come away from a dream, especially something like a nightmare, they have this sense of fear. And so they want to avoid that thing. When yes. in reality, like what you're saying, the fear is actually the dream ego or the ego not wanting to encounter what the unconscious wants it to encounter. Exactly. Yeah, that makes exactly. a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, well, thank you. I, I mean, it's every time I ask somebody, they gave me this tiny little new, this new nuance to it and this perspective. Mm -hmm. It's just, mm -hmm. it's it's a lot of fun. Um, okay, I want to talk to you about your your new book, and it just recently came out, maybe last week even. A couple um, weeks ago now. A couple weeks ago. Okay. The Vital Spark, Reclaim Your Outlaw Energies and Find Your Feminine Fire. Um, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I um, I came across this, uh, I came across this quote, um, and basically it's just a definition of this, this term bibliotherapy. Mm -hmm. And I find it, I find it interesting how many union analysts go on to write something where they can share it with a broader audience. And for me personally, I would say that bibliotherapy is probably the most consistent form of therapy, of mentorship, of training that I've experienced throughout my whole life because mm -hmm. I found that I learn things through reading and then I learn things from doing things in real life and, and everything else sitting in classes or, you know, it, it just, there's something about a book that really sp can speak to me and I can integrate it. And you spend time with a book, you spend days, um, weeks even. And when you look back on your life, or at least when I look back on my life, it's almost as if there are all these little chunks of time that were these little epics. And it's like, oh, what was I reading? Or or what TV show was I binge watching? And those mm -hmm. things just really, I don't know, there's something about books that get me through life. So um, mm -hmm. I just appreciate you being a writer or just, you know, people who are willing to go and, and put the time in and, and, and put that out there, the vulnerability of it. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think I wanted to be a writer. I mean, I, I think I wanted to... I think I wanted to write a book ever since I kind of knew what a book was pretty much. But, um, you know, throughout my life, like I just told the story about this book by Linda Leonard, which literally changed my life, you know, and that th there's so many times when a book has, um, been the, been the shifted something, been the answer, been the medicine that I needed. And, and I, I just, I mean, it totally makes sense that I would write because, uh, you know, to think that I could do for someone, for example, what Linda Leonard did for me is incredibly motivating, you know, and, and I, my, my first book was called motherhood facing and finding yourself. And I, I, I mean the, some, I had some of the messages that I, I got, you know, like some, someone once said, you know, I, I, I was in a, you know, terrible postpartum depression. And then I read your book and it really lifted. And it's like, wow, wow. That's, that's amazing. You know, so that's, it's very meaningful to me. And, uh, and I yeah. love writing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there's something about a book that it, instead of being face to face with a person, you get a dialogue in such a way that you can be the, the person in the book, the writer, the author can be so vulnerable in such a way that it allows you to just experience that vulnerability mm -hmm. in a very safe situation, like a very calm, mm -hmm. you could be laying in bed, you can have your cat or dog cuddled up next to you. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's great. With um, with <laughs> they are with this book, the Vital Spark. Uh, I guess the big question: what What is this Vital Spark, and and why is it um, why is it that women or girls um, in particular need to reclaim this? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think the vital spark is maybe the the metaphor for uh, what what we were talking about before. You know, the the self with the capital S that that bigger, deeper part of us, or at least our ability to be in connection with it. And uh, it's it's you know, it's not that men, I'm sure, have their struggles in remaining connected with it for for different reasons. Well, and maybe some of the same reasons actually, but. Um, you know, what I wind up saying in the book is that there are traits like kindness, warmness, nurturance, and empathy that are really focused on nurturing relationships and helping us get and stay connected with other people. 
but but we all also have come into the world maybe with an inner drive or or uh you know something as Jim Hollis says that needs to come into the world through us and to 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 help that get into the world we have to be able to access some of these other qualities that I talk about in the book like aggression and authority and even ruthlessness desire shrewdness uh, that those qualities help us get and stay connected to ourselves. And and uh, not that we should be all this and none of that. It's a both and, right? We want to we wanna develop lots of different capacities and be able to use them choicefully. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that just to linger a little bit on this idea of men and women, I think in our modern world, obviously, there's like this big confusion this big kind of tension mm-hmm. between the in this world and so it it i think it's valuable to look at the different angles through which people experience life and whether you're born with an xy chromosome or two x chromosomes you're going to have different drives you're going to have different experiences your culture is going to look at you differently mm-hmm. and so i think it's it's I don't know, there is this big push for everybody to be the same, to be the same, but there's this necessity that we recognize that we're different in mm-hmm. such a way that we can approach life differently. Mm-hmm. And in in this respect, there are things obviously that men experience um, that women don't, but there's also this thing that happens to women, both from culture and from families, religions, whatever it may be, where these aspects of them are hidden for some reason they're repressed Mm -hmm. and it's one of the great things about i think about all this union psychology and kind of this a willingness to discuss it is that it's it's really about balance and about yeah but about not repressing these things so that everybody can participate in a more balanced way Mm -hmm. yeah i mean one of the things that Jung says is the point of individuation the point of kind of psychological development is wholeness and by that, he means that you develop all aspects of yourself. So if you're an introvert, then maybe you, you know, try to step into more extroversion. If you are a feeling type, maybe you work on developing your thinking function. If you have a lot of masculine qualities, whether or not you're a man or a woman, by the way, maybe you need to focus on developing some of those feminine traits and vice versa. So it it really is um, it really is an invitation that everything belongs. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but in in your book, you point out that these, in some cases, these are outlaw energies, mm-hmm. meaning that for some reason we feel like, or the broader collective or society feels like maybe they shouldn't belong. What? Um, yeah, go ahead. Well, I, so you know. The, <laughs> I, I say something that some people in the book find controversial, but it was important for me to put it in there. And maybe it's like very politically incorrect, but I definitely, definitely agree that women are, um, have a hard time with some of, uh, because in part with some of these things, because of what society kind of expects of women. So I'll give you an example. When I was in my 20s, I worked in the field of international humanitarian assistance. And I was, you know, I was probably like 24, 25. And I had this job. I was the program officer for disaster response for a, um, for like an, an umbrella organization of NGOs. And so there were some, when, when there would be like a disaster with NGO response, A lot of times, this was in D.C., a lot of times, you know, the media would ask me to do an interview. So uh, I, you know, kind of got some experience, you know, kind of doing doing media stuff a little bit, you know. Anyway, I think one day I was at the CBC office, the Canadian Broadcasting Company, and I was uh, there to give an interview about, I don't know, Sudan or something. And I, and I go in and the, the person before me was a, you know, 50-ish year old man. And he comes out in a bluster. He'd just been interviewed. And he said, pointed to me, he said, can you get me a cup of coffee? 
And, you know, the, 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 uh, other, the interviewer said, um, that's our next guest, you know, but I mean, it's a, it's a little example, but it's an example that probably most women would have some version of that. And, and it's not even a, the most terrible version, right? Like some women are subjected to really much worse things. Um, and that is very real and it's, and it's cultural, um, so certainly there are cultural expectations of women and men that, that sometimes really disadvantage women. But, um, I, for one also think that men have their own difficulties. Um, I, I would, you know, I, I'm a firm believer that men don't have it so easy either. I didn't write a book about that, but I believe that. But I also think that some of the injunction against, for example, being um, angry or being fierce or or being ruthless is probably hardwired. And I know I'm not supposed to think that. I know that that's <laughs> heresy. No, I <laughs> not in, not on this podcast. Okay. But there, there is a, there is evidence for it, and it's 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 you know it's not conclusive evidence. But I'm I'm not just making this up. I mean, there are there are studies with neonates. There are studies with primates. You know this 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 uh, truth that in general men are more interested in things and women are more interested in people. I mean, there's cross cultural research. The finding that women tend to be more agreeable than men is across cultures and across the lifespan. And by the way, it makes sense, right? Because, you know, we're, we, as a species, we, we sort of require, I mean, somebody has to be very attuned to tiny helpless infants and take care of them, which is like a 24 seven job for years on end. And usually that's mostly women. And, I, you know, I mean, if you look at primates or, you know, traditional cultures, it's like, so, you know, hello, we're mammals. <laughs> and so it makes sense that we might have some sex specific traits uh, and that there might be this kind of rough. Now, I'm not being proscriptive. I'm not saying women should be barefoot and pregnant and only women should take care of children. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it makes sense that we might, we as women might have uh, both pressure from the culture to be good, to be kind, to be agreeable, to put our needs aside and focus on other people. Yes, you're here to get me coffee, young lady. That must be all you are good for. You know, it's like, no, I'm here to give an interview. But I also think that that is, uh, that, that we, we may find a kind of inner injunction against uh, being some of those things that that might just maybe have uh, one of its roots in, dare I say, biology. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that if you just if you just look at us as an evolutionary species, right, there's there's different mechanisms for survival. There's different tools, there's different strategies. And it's pretty obvious, both from a bio, like if, like you you mentioned neonates and primates. If you look outside of our species, across mammals and even mm -hmm. even broader a broader spectrum, there's it's pretty obvious that there's a split in responsibility and mm -hmm. purpose. Mm -hmm. But I also think that if you, being a union analyst and all the Greek tragedies you read, and just diving into myth it's pretty apparent even in myth that there are these two forces that are not actually in opposition to each other, mm -hmm. but are supposed to work on each other yeah. to, to create like a third thing. Yeah. That's um, great. Which is like really the, like the same kind of survival. Yeah. 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 They're not, in, they're, 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 they're opposites, but they're not in opposition and both in the culture and in ourselves individually, I think the goal should be, to um, develop both and value both. Yeah, absolutely. Even, I mean, to geek out just for a second, even on a broader scale, if you look at the entire formation of the earth, uh, of humanity on the earth, the, the split that happened somewhere at the beginning of the axial age where 
one side of the world went to a more kind of collective way of being and the other side of the world, our Western side of the world went to this much more, it's, it's much more about constantly differentiating and constantly categorizing and constantly ordering. And at some point the, it, the entire, the entire planet's going to have to acknowledge that these things aren't actually in opposition that we've been helping each other all along. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. Okay, so these eight outlaw energies, uh, their core aspects of of a woman or of a person that they maybe do get repressed, they get slighted, they get, uh, you know, Captain Hook gets his hand cut off and so he's missing Mm -hmm. a part of himself. Um, Do you want to dive into some of these? Is there, are there any specifically that that maybe we should talk about? Seems well. I'll, maybe I could just read them off really yeah. quick. So yeah, yeah there's yeah. there's shrewdness, disagreeableness, desire, trickiness, sexuality, anger, authority, and ruthlessness. Mm-hmm. And it seems to be. I mean, the theme of the book being that these are things that women, particularly in our Western world, struggle with, and that in order to, you know, experience that wholeness or the the balance. Um, of the self, then it's about reclaiming these aspects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, to put it another way, this sort of echoing what I said before, but you know, if, if your goal is to like, let's say get married and have kids, then the traits of like agreeableness and uh, warmth and nurturance and selflessness. Great. That's going to be great. If your goal is to <laughs> not completely lose yourself under uh, under the burden of caring for uh, a children and in some cases a husband, because some husbands require a lot of care, uh, you're going to need some different qualities. And if you if you also have a need to bring something else into the world, a creative project, um, uh, 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 you know, a, a profession, um, uh, it's some kind of vision, whatever it is, then again, you're going to need these other qualities too. So it's both are useful, both sets and, and we can cultivate them and and use them as appropriate. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe let's just, um, cover a couple really quickly. Shrewdness. Mm -hmm. What is, what is, what do you mean by shrewdness and what Mm -hmm. is it that, well, what's the benefit of it, but what, why also do you think that it's um, difficult. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I'm just, I just, I want to, maybe I want to read just a little bit from the beginning of that one. Yeah, absolutely. Because it kind of gets us. So the title of the chapter is shrewdness, getting over innocence. And, um, I'm not going to read the little starter story. Um, Shrewdness is the ability to see things as they are, not as we wish they were or think they should be. The dictionary tells us that shrewd means having or showing sharp powers of judgment, astute. The term was taken from the small rodent, the shrew, which has a long pointed snout and tiny eyes. It originally meant evil in nature or character. To this day, the word shrew has two meanings. It refers to the small mammal, but it also means a bad-tempered or aggressively assertive woman. This one word then reveals a deep cultural truth. Women with sharp powers of judgment are considered bad-tempered or aggressively assertive. To avoid being a shrew, a woman mustn't be too shrewd. Don't see what there is to know. Remain innocent and naive. So uh, I, I think that um, there, there is a way that uh, women are, can be encouraged, and again, this might be an inner thing and an outer thing, to be kind of innocent and dependent and to look to others to take care of us. Uh, I think kind of opening your eyes and letting yourself see what there is to see uh, is difficult, but it's also uh, incredibly empowering and very important uh, if we're, if we plan to be able to, for example, take care of ourselves in a difficult or, um, you know, potentially hostile environment. 
Yeah, absolutely. I've actually just been reading, speaking of the collected works, I've been reading psychology of the unconscious and learning a lot mm -hmm. about the libido and this idea of seeing things as they are, as opposed to, you know, what you would hope they would be, or in, in terms of this book, what you would fantasize they would be. Yeah. And this idea of going from, I think it's made me think a lot about maturation growing up, moving from childhood to adulthood, where you have to move from this place where somebody else takes care of you. And the world then is just kind of however you want it to be mm -hmm. into this phase of you have to accept the world as it is so that you can adapt to it so that you could react to it in a exactly. way that's beneficial. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's exactly what I'm trying to get at. I mean, you can't adapt to the world if you, if you are, um, if you're, if you have, if you're just lost in fantasy, if you don't, uh, uh, you know, if you, if you, if you can't abandon the, the kind of neurotic fantasy of, you know, well, it's, it's how I want it to be. You know, that is not, that is not, well, it's adapt. It might be adaptive in some sense, but it's not a good adaptation because ultimately you, you're, you're not, you're not dealing with reality. This is why I love it when Joseph says reality is medicinal. It might not feel good, but it, it's medicinal. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And then the other thought about it is, uh, shrewdness. You bring up these two definitions of there's the shrew, which is this animal, but it's also, uh, uh, a woman who's looked at like a shrew. She's, mm -hmm. um, it makes me think of virtue from an, from like an Aristotle perspective where if on one end you have innocence and then there's this bell curve over to the other side or a polarity to the other side is shrewdness. Uh, is there, I guess shrewdness might be in the middle and to the other side, not sure. Uh, perhaps, perhaps the, it's the image of maybe part of shrewdness is not, is being aware of how others also perceive you in a sense mm -hmm. so that you're not, uh, you're not acting like a child, but you're also not acting as if you know everything. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so shrewdness in a way would be in this, this center point between these two opposing ways of being. Yeah. I mean, I think ideally if we're shrewd, we, we see ourselves pretty realistically. And I do spend some time in that chapter talking about, um, like when women can't acknowledge their own strengths, how, you know, I think that that's part of shrewdness too. It's like, Oh, okay. I have, I have these good qualities, but you know, also I have these bad qualities. It's very hard to have an accurate self-assessment. I mean, we, we tend to make uh, pretty uh, significant uh, mistakes in one direction or the other or both. Um, but to the extent that we can try to just be very clear-eyed about ourselves, about what our strengths are and about what our weaknesses are, that's also very empowering. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's well said. Um, one thing that I see... Uh, some of the women in my life struggle with is a, is like a certain form of assertiveness. Mm -hmm. And I think that this comes across in two of the, maybe two of the category or the core aspects that you point out, one of them being disagreeableness and mm -hmm. the other being ruthlessness. Mm -hmm. So disagreeableness, maybe just being, you know, pushing back or not being accepting, like maybe not just complying. And mm -hmm. sometimes women can feel, um, uncertain about their, their, the level of uncompliance or non-compliance that they can participate in. But mm -hmm. then also on the, on this other flip side of ruthlessness, not only not complying, but seeing exactly what you want and going for it. Um, despite what even others, if it, even if it makes someone right. Exactly. Yeah. No, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts a little bit about this idea of assertiveness in terms of disagreeableness and ruthlessness yeah. and, yeah. and what, like, where's the balance to be found? Well, I'd be, I'd be also really curious, like when you say you see women in your life having trouble with assertiveness, like what are you seeing? Well, um, <laughs> a lot of it is just in dialogue with the women in my life. Mm -hmm. So my wife, um, friends that I have where they, 
Um, maybe at work, they want to be able to say a certain thing. Maybe in a friend group, they want to be able to say a certain thing, maybe state an opinion. Um, uh, maybe even amongst family, they want to be able to uh, have a voice because there's like an underlying opinion that maybe disagrees with the the group. Um, mm-hmm. But for whatever reason, they find it difficult to kind of stand mm-hmm. out. They, they almost don't yep. want the attention of that standing out. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's definitely a kind of so that that I you know first of all these categories are, are somewhat arbitrary and they kind of mush together and some other woman might might have come up with a totally different quality so there's no particular authority to this list but uh, you know I think that that tendency of like oh I, I don't I don't want to stand out I don't want to make I don't I don't want to you know sort of make anyone feel uncomfortable or anything like that is definitely in the let, let me be agreeable. And uh, one of the stories that I tell in the book, I I love this story and it's a totally true story. I had this um, when I was in my thirties and I was working in the former Yugoslavia, I had this friend who was in her fifties and she used to have us over to her apartment and make us these great meals. And, you know, we'd be sitting out on her roof deck under the stars with a glass of wine and she'd come upstairs. It'd be like 10 o'clock. She'd say, okay, it was really nice having you over, but I'm going to bed now and you need to leave. And the first time it happened, I was like, what? Oh my God, I'm getting kicked out. But then I was like, huh, wow, look at that. I mean, I still don't quite think I've got it in me to do that. (laughs) But, um, but what a great, like what a totally awesome thing to do, you know, to just be able to, I don't, you know, I had fun with you and now I'm done and I want to go to sleep, you know? So, you know, my friend Terry was not particularly worried about being agreeable. She didn't really care if our feelings got hurt. I mean, I think ruthlessness is maybe like that to a greater degree because it, it's where it's where it's not, you're not making someone just a little uncomfortable. You might, you might really be wounding them. Um, but it's in service to growth and wholeness. So it's you're not wounding someone just for the sake of wounding them. You're not wounding them for revenge. You're, you're wounding them because it is necessary. So I think actually, when I think about ruthless, I think about, um, you know, uh, um, if, if you, if you, if you know a surgeon or you've ever been to a doctor like that, who, you know, it's like they, they hurt you in order to, um, assess what's going on. You know, I mean, I, I've, you know, I've, I've had procedures where it's like, that fucking hurts. But the doctor has been trained to find his or her ruthlessness to continue doing it, even though it hurts, because they've got to, you know, get do the biopsy or whatever it is, you know. Um, so that's that's sort of the example of, of ruthlessness or that's an example of ruthlessness that w- when we have to kind of learn that it's like, well, it's you know, in in that case, it's in the interest of taking care of a person. But sometimes we have to be ruthless because, you know, I need to say what I want or I, I need to, uh, assert myself, even though it might hurt someone's feelings, even though it might really impact someone. I mean, the, the example that I use in the book is, uh, that I was seeing when I was younger, I was seeing a psychologist and it just wasn't, it wasn't working. It wasn't a good fit. And I, I needed to tell her that, but I was like, Oh, I don't want to hurt her feelings. It's like, it's my treatment. It's my money. It's my time. But I was like, Oh, I, I can't, I can't, I don't, ah, she might feel bad, you know? And, and of course I, I just, I mean, I don't even know that she did feel bad, but you know, that was my fantasy, but, uh, but it was like, no, I need to just go and and say, this isn't working and I'm going to, this can be my last session or whatever. Um, I had to be a little bit ruthless because it was totally appropriate to put my own needs first in that situation. Yeah, absolutely. In a way you said that this list is not some authoritative authoritative list and any woman could have come up could have come up with it but just listening to you talk about this disagreeableness and ruthlessness it 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 seems like a very good idea that you started with shrewdness because shrewdness Mm -hmm. allows you to decipher all these different things you're able to kind of see through it and pierce through it and um this analogy to the surgeon who's willing to hurt in order to heal Mm-hmm. In a sense, I think what you're talking about is the ability to 
perform that type of surgery on a relationship, on, on emotions, on somebody's mental state or, or like interaction with you. And in a way also to set boundaries. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, you know, even, I mean, I can totally relate to this idea of not wanting to hurt the psychologist's feelings or the, yeah. you know, your therapist. I've had so many situations where I'm, I'm the one, they're providing service to me and I don't want to tell them that it's bad. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. um, right, right, right. But at some point, at some level, if they have any level of shrewdness themselves, if they have any kind of awareness or introspection into what is happening because of their behavior, it's actually just like the surgeon performing a surgery. It's in, it's in service to them in service to their growth as a provider of something to, mm -hmm. to understand that for some reason, the service they're providing isn't, isn't helpful, yeah. isn't what you're looking for. It's not actually a kind thing to pretend that something works when it doesn't, you know, it's not, you know, the real feedback, real life feedback. Uh, well, we're back to reality as medicinal, like knowing the truth is actually helpful even when it's hard. Yeah, absolutely. And, and sometimes you just have, sometimes it's painful to be the messenger, uh, mm -hmm. but sometimes that's the role you have to play. Mm -hmm. Um, well, Lisa, we are over an hour and these conversations, they always fly past. This was a lot of fun and I appreciate it. Um, thanks. Thanks for your, all this energy that you put into this world of, of depth psychology and, um, the conversations that you have, um, on, on this union life. And then also for, for the, you know, your writing and the books that you're putting out there. I'm actually really interested to see this next book as well. Um, mm -hmm. dream wise, yes. uh, I hope it's, you know, you, 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 uh, really talked it up. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited for it and I hope it comes out as, uh, I'm sure that I'll consume it in the same way that you, that you wrote it with this like passion for it. So yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I'm super excited about it. So. Good, <laughs> yeah. good year, good year, two good yeah. books out. So yeah. Awesome. Um, before we get off, is there, uh, how can people find your work? Where can they find your podcast, your mm -hmm. books? Um, if they're in your area, where would they find, find you as far as, um, th uh, services? So, uh, my author website is Lisa and, uh, the web, the podcast website is this union .com. I also do have some offerings. I have an online fairy tale group for women. It's really cool. We're going through, the uh, fairy tales in the vital spark now, one at a time. We started with Fitcher's Bird uh, last month, and in the month month of March, we're starting with um, the Frog Prince, or the Frog Prince King. Um, and we just we talk about a fairy tale every month. There are prompts. There's a live uh, that I do once a month, and other cool things like that. Um, and that's called Spinning Straw, and you can uh, sign up for a free trial at spinningstraw.com and check that out. And I also do, if you're, if you're, you know, if you're on the East Coast or you don't mind a little bit of travel, I run uh, fairy tale and yoga retreats for women. I have one coming up at the end of April, and you can read about on that on my website, uh, lisamarciano.com. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you, Lisa. I really appreciate this. And uh, hopefully we can do it again sometime. I'd love to. Okay. Thank you. And bye.